Hello, I'm your host, John Cavendish, and welcome to the Amazon Strategy Show, the show that's all strategy with no hacks, no silver bullets, and no magic pills, just real practical strategies for your Amazon business. So my guest today is a transplant like me. So uh, wasn't born in the country he currently lives, but has been based in Israel for, I think, 10 years. Maybe I got that totally wrong. He's been in the e-commerce space for 10 years and with Sellerstat for five years. And uh, what they work on is repricing. And they've got some really cool repricing strategies. And I think one of the most advanced repricers out there. So I'm really looking forward to diving into uh, how the technology works and how it's different from the competition. He also has an amazing dog called Nala, who has now been taken out from the back. She was very cute and in the back to start with. And uh, without further ado, please welcome to the stage, Ian. Hey, John, how's it going? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Hello. And uh, sorry, I didn't ask you how to pronounce your surname. Uh, Kanashiro. So Ian Kanashiro. Kanashiro. Where's that from? It's Japanese. Japanese. Cool. Yeah. Coming from, coming from the States, oftentimes you get it butchered all the time. So it, uh, it doesn't bother me at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. So, um, yeah, I mean, how long have you been in Israel, in Tel Aviv? I've been in Israel for seven, eight years. Kind of start, stop counting at some points. It just becomes, a, it stops feeling like a, like a trip and it just ends up becoming your life, you know? I'm sure you can relate. Yeah, I totally identify with that. You know, it's like home, isn't it? And once you, when somewhere feels like home, you're like, ah, I like going back there. It's great. It's convenient. I know it. Yeah, I yeah. love being, uh, being based abroad. You have your sock drawer and you have your snack drawer, and that's basically all, all you need. <laughs> well, you need a few other things, but those are those are some of the highlights. Yeah, I'd like that. Just like two drawers in your room, sock drawer, snack drawer, home. Just, just don't tell the wife about the hidden snacks, you know? Oh, yeah, she, yeah. My wife, well, my wife likes Vietnamese snacks, so you don't want Vietnamese snacks. I mean, you do if you, when you get into them, but there's some sort of interesting stuff, like very chilly, spicy rice paper, Ooh. different crunchy things. Uh, the chili rice paper is really good. She got me into it. They're like, it's like chili oil mixed with rice paper, and then just like, it's great. That sounds delicious. All the spicy and what would like be, I, you know, tagged as weird stuff from the East is... The stuff I love to get into. Um, nah, me too. Everything apart from the really fermented stuff with like fermented shrimp is one of the most p pungent things you can ever have in your life. Wow. Sounds delicious. So before I get too far into Vietnamese food, which I, which I do love, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about Seller Snap and, uh, and how you ended up there and what you, what Seller Snap does. Sure. Um, how I ended up at Seller Snap is, um, once I moved to Tel Aviv, you know, there's a really big tech scene here. Um, I bounced around through um, a bunch of different roles from account management sales in um, in the tech space, um, kind of getting, eventually finding my way to seller stuff, kind of getting back to my roots of, of e-commerce. Yeah. As a kid, um, I, I grew up kind of working, you know, part-time summers, you know, Q4s for um, a family business um, that was selling in the e-commerce space. They started out with catalogs, had a website, and then moved into Amazon before eventually selling the business. And, you know, I was, whatever, 15, 16, packing boxes, accepting returns, taking pictures for listings, that kind of stuff. Just whatever, whatever they need, just, um, just doing, just doing a little bit of everything. And it was just a really interesting transition because once I found, once I found SellerSnap, um, kind of found myself back in the e-commerce world. Um, I really was starting to make the connection of all those years in the warehouse, like what was going on. I really started to make those connections between, you know, the the logistics side and well, and the listings and the product and how to and how to market that, and and then what the different types of you know the technologies that you need in order to make right. that operation happen because you go from very you know hands on touching everything to, you know, touching my keyboard the mo most of the day. And so, um, that's, that was kind of a little bit about my background, but in terms of seller right. sap, um, what we do is we are an Amazon repricer and in short for anyone that doesn't know what that is, it's mainly for, it's a tool mainly for resellers that attempts to get the buy box. So basically the buy box, again, uh, for anyone that doesn't know is on the right side of the screen you have the option to add to cart or buy now as a customer. And so all these third-party sellers that are reselling goods that have that are competing against other resellers are fighting for that spot um, in order to be that sale when the when the client clicks add to cart or buy now. 
And so in the background, there's a ton of different systems, including Amazon has their own repricer and a bunch of third parties like ourselves that are um, using algorithms of various degrees and logic of various degrees in order to put our clients in that spot. And so where Seller Sound kind of separates ourselves is we focus on profit and profit margin um, by getting the buy box at the highest possible price by avoiding price wars. Awesome. I love that. So, I mean, so yeah, mainly you're for online arbitrage sellers, which actually from seller candies, probably about 40% of our clients. And um, yeah, so what percentage of sellers are actually using reprices in your experience? Do you, do you have any data for that? In terms of the resellers? Yeah. What percentage of resellers are using a external repricer? Um, you know, I would assume that I don't have any direct data on it, but just some anecdotal data is... Yeah. Even sellers that only have, you know, 10 or 15 listings end up using a repricer of some sort in my experience. Because yeah. as I mentioned, even Amazon has a free repricer through Seller Central. And so uh, because all of these systems are working 24-7, the people that are repricing manually tend to find themselves really quickly in a position where they need a repricer. So if they're not ready to yeah. necessarily go out and pay for one, uh, they'll move to Amazon and use uh, that repricer for free. Hmm. That makes sense. So, so basically, it's tech on tech. That's why I was going with that question. Like, you're 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 mostly bidding then against other repricers. So, how do you avoid the getting into price wars? It's a really great question. Um, avoiding getting into price wars is a complicated topic. The reason is is because what is the point of a repricer? The point of the repricer is to capture the buy box, and sometimes right. that means that we have to. Um, undercut our competitors in order to do so. But it uh, it also doesn't mean we always have to undercut our competitors. Yeah. So as a technology system, we have to make a decision what we want to do, what action do we want to take based on all the data and all the information that we collect. And so I'll, and so I'll run through a couple of really short examples just to sure. kind of get our, our minds jogging around that. The first one is that, um, you know, oftentimes with rule-based repricers, what we see is that competitors are using a system that's like undercut my lowest competitor by a penny, right? Yeah. So that is the the start of the price war because if you and I are on- like 101. Yeah. Exactly. So if you and I are on a listing together, I undercut you, you undercut me and we drop the price down. Now in that scenario, a repricer doesn't have much we can do, right? We have to play that game. But where seller snap comes into play is that we see that this is happening and we see right. that, you know, you, John, you're using a rule that says undercut the competitor by a penny. Yeah. So you just see bam, 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 bam. When you make changes, they make changes. Like tip the tap. Exactly. And so what happens is that we see that this is happening and then we will move up in price either to our max price or a portion of max price or even your max price, depending on the different factors that we've already been able to kind of sniff out, so to speak. At, at yeah. which point, because of your rule, you'll come up with us. And then what we'll do is we'll re then re-engage with you. We'll undercut you, let you undercut me until the price gets too low. And then we'll move back up in price, kind of restarting that cycle. So we'll have kind of a micro price war, but we're doing it at the at the higher price. And so sometimes avoiding price wars is a non-starter. You have to, you have to engage if you want to play. But there are other other scenarios where using an AI technology or advanced repricer is going to be really helpful for that bottom line as well. Um, for example, when um, we see that for an SBA competitor, for an, you know, or for you know a competitor that's fulfilled by Amazon, sometimes they come in on the listing. You know, they're they're brand new sellers. They don't have any ratings. Uh, yeah. They don't have any reviews, and they are you know undercutting my price, right? So maybe I'm at twenty dollars, they're at nineteen ninety nine. But because Amazon you know, striving to be the most customer centric, um, company on the planet, they said, well, we want to provide the best customer service. So what are we going to do? We're going to give it to the tried and true. So yeah. the FBA competitor who has a ton of reviews, you know, um, really high ratings. And so I might get the buy box at $20, even though my competitors at 19.90. And so yeah. that is something that's, and just like that really simple example of something that seller sap can read. Because what, like, why is that important? Because with a, you know, with a rule, I would normally set undercut by a penny. So what would happen is I would undercut my, that competitor to 1998, they would do to 97. 
and we drive the price down even though I already have the buy box. Hmm. So it probably monitors the buy box. Yeah, it monitors the buy box, it monitors the pricing, and it is also constantly asking itself, can I continue to get the buy box at this higher price? So it says, oh, I'm at $20, my competitor is at $19.99. What happens if I move up to $21? So I still win the buy box. I do? Great. What about if I move up to $22, $23? I hit $23 and I lost the buy box. What about $22.50? Okay, I'm at twenty two fifty. I'm in the buy box, and then it's going to keep asking that kind of those kind of questions. If I make this decision, how does that affect my my buy box? You know, win percentage, win yeah. rate. Back? That's awesome. So when you were talking before about the other strategy, where you're you know you're step you're stepping down and stepping up, how quickly does that refresh? So you're stepping down, you get the buy box, then your competitor's repricer comes in, takes it. Like how often is Amazon doing that switch, or how often can you be doing it? Uh, that's a great question. So in terms of how often, you know, we do reprice, just like every other third party system out there, we are held to very specific um, standards by Amazon's SBA API or their seller partner API. And basically there's, um, for anyone that doesn't know, there's a thing that's called throttling that you get so, um, the best way to describe it is that you get so many resources and Amazon says, you get X amount of resources, X amount of, you know, API calls, um, in a minute or in an hour. And once you do that, we stop processing for you. So for the repricing feeds, it's, um, it's 30 feeds an hour or one or once every two minutes. So in terms of the fastest that we can possibly reprice, it's once every two minutes, but the AI also sets its own repricing interval based off of, you know, that two minute kind of like maximum refresh rate, you could say, yeah. and what our competitors are doing. So if you are on a listing, you're using um, a repricer that's only repressing every half hour, 45 minutes, there's no need for me to constantly reprice and be making price changes. So the AI is going to see that, say, okay, John, who is competitor X, is only repressing every 45 minutes. So let's uh, let's back, let's back off. We're going to change the repricing into full and, uh, and make that change later on. Nice. So when you say feeds, could that be like, is that basically like a flat file feed? So you can change as many prices as you want during that feed time. So you can update a thousand prices at once, or is that feed for a single price, up, an update of single price of product? Yeah. Great question. So the feed is a, is a file on the can. Okay. And so the file can contain multiple listings, um, in that single event. Cool. Yeah, I was thinking it must do. It's just uh, just for clarity of my my thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. So, I guess what kind of results can people expect from using Seller Snap over a you know lowest possible like Amazon's repricer, for example, just start bidding a cent low, like a rule based repricer. So, yeah. The some of the results that we commonly see is that um, sellers will see higher average selling prices, and so what that means is that I'm maximizing my price per se. And so why is that yeah. important, especially for FBA competitors, is that we have some variable costs, but a lot of our costs are fixed, right? We have our, our cost of goods sold or COGS, um, and, and we have a relevant Amazon fees, FBA fees are generally fixed. And and so that means, you know, if, you know, my cost of goods sold is, is $5, my Amazon fee is $8, and then I have, you know, my referral fees and everything else. My referral fees is based off my selling price. So I don't have much to do there, but that means, but when I'm selling at a higher price, it means I can get more out of that $8 that I have to spend anyways. And so yeah. often, oftentimes what we'll see in, in trials is that, um, you know, you'll see sometimes even dips in ordered items and sometimes even revenue, but you'll see increases in profit. Right. And that's super important to identify because I talk to the customers all the time and you know, we always talk about, you know, revenue doesn't pay the bills. It doesn't keep the lights on. Yeah. Um, profit does. And so that's often really important when we're considering like, how, how do we want to reprice? Because sometimes you have to move product, you know, hmm. you shoot your shot, it's the wrong product or, you know, you're a hundred units seat, a thousand units seat, and you need to recoup that cash. That has to happen right. sometimes. But on the product center winners, and if you have the cash flow, you don't have to necessarily sell out in a week or two days um, to operate a healthy business. Might as well sell. You know, you have 
you have 90 days until you start and so like long-term storage fees really start kicking in so yeah. you have it's an extended amount of time to to try to sell um items at the highest possible price and then you can start to make other decisions on how how you want to operate with that inventory nice and so what level of detail do uh client to customers put into put into seller snap of about the products do they do you actually do anything with margin calculations or do they just set the the range of price they want to sell at and you just go for the max you can possibly get yeah so in order to really in short in order to reprice with seller snap you need a mean price a max price and to turn on a repricer we don't have any yeah. complex rules that you have to set up you don't have to go in and create your logic the ai does it all for you um, but we do have the ability to input a bunch of different values, um, in order to help calculate those mints and max prices. For example, mm. the mid price is really important. And so, um, you can input your cost. Oftentimes, um, people use our integration with companies like, um, inventory lab and, and seller cloud and SKU vault, for example, are some of our integration partners to pull in that cost and we pull in the cost. Um, relevant Amazon fees like FBA and referral fees. And then the seller might say, I want a markup of X percentage of 20%, 30%. And then we will take into account all of those different uh, values and set that min price. Uh, we have a similar tool for the max price, but most of the time these days, sellers are using um, a feature that's about a year old. It's called dynamic max price or DMP, which takes into account a bunch of these similar factors, I should say to create yeah. a max price, but also um, constantly adjust it up. In those scenarios where you're selling at your max price, um, the DMP, for example, will start to move that price up. So if you're selling at your max, that's not where you stop. There's always room for, for growth there. Yeah, I love it. It's super cool. And um, yeah, I mean, it's great that you actually have AI doing that because yeah, as you said, most resellers as they scale have hundreds if not thousands of SKUs. There's no way that you could do this for anything like the cost that you charge and you guys aren't particularly cheap but it's still insane it's still you could never do it here the human with that at that cost yeah i think that the biggest thing that you know growing sellers have a hard time wrapping their head around that you know the big sellers do automatically is trusting in the systems that you you onboard and right. it's not this isn't anything that's special for the amazon space you know every company does it Every Amazon business does it. Selly Snap does it. I'm sure Seller Candy does it. We all onboard technological partners and softwares all day, every day to make our lives easier. And so I think that when it when it boils down to, because repricing is such an integral part of operating an Amazon business for, you know, for arbitragers, online retail, and even wholesalers as well, anybody that's reselling, it's important to kind of, you know, do your homework find the right tool that's for you in, you know, where you're at in your Amazon journey and kind of what you need to hit those business objectives. You know, for some people it's, uh, early on, it might be the Amazon repricer for some other people it might be one of our competitors, uh, that hey. offer a little bit more competitive pricing, but not all the same features. And then as, um, and as you kind of go through your Amazon journey, that also has to change. You, you start to take hey. a look at, you know, what's working, what's not, how can I improve? Yeah, I totally agree there as well. I mean, you know, at Seller Candy, we, you know, we're a so, you know, productized service business. So we have a lot of, we're a service-based business and we still spend what, probably nine or 10% of our revenue on outsourced SaaS service providers just to make things better because it would cost us loads more money to pay, make, pay humans to do that. Yeah. You know, five figures a month worth of just SaaS. Just, just CRM, for example, just our, you know, your customer relationship That's management tool. HubSpot, <laughs> Salesforce, Zendesk, yeah, yeah. you know, customer customer service tools. You have, you know, Help Scout and Intercom. It, it just all, it all adds up, but it's all necessary in order to operate a business. And, you know, neither of us are immune to that kind of, uh, to that kind of stuff. But, you know, you have to see that it costs way more to develop and to develop it right um, but... than it, it does to, to pay someone, you know, monthly or quarterly or annually. It's just... It's just one of those things that you have to have to get used to uh, being okay with. No, for sure, I get it. I mean, we've been developing a little, a few apps for ourselves, and you know, thirty grand disappears like nothing. So the fifty thousand dollars a year we spend between our CRM and our help desk is a great investment, even though it's an insane amount of money that I never thought we'd be spending on things yeah. like CRMs. 
Yeah. And the thing is, because that's their specialty, you know, yeah. they're going to be better at it than, than than you are. You know, I I speak to customers. I speak to customers all the time who go and you know they're like, we have an internal repricing tool, but when they hear about some of the really cool things we, some of the really cool features we had, even from the basic stuff that we spoke about from calculating mid and max to some stuff that's a little bit more complex that we have the, what's called the mm-hmm. reduced profit range or the RPR, which is like this range for referral fees where you actually mm-hmm. make less money at certain points. So, um, because of the, the jump in referral fees from eight to 15%, for example, you know, these yep. are things that it's difficult to think of. And, we put a lot of thought into it because it's our specialty. And I think that's like, uh, that's the, the main thing that's not, when we're talking about scaling, how we, how we have to look at, um, bringing on, bringing in the experts. Yeah. I think mean, totally in alignment with that in the way that we just deal with seller support. It's like, nobody else wants to spend 12 hours a day on the phone with seller support. And we've yep. got 50 people that do it all day, every day. I agree. Cause nobody else wants to, it's the worst thing to do. Um, one final question, actually, because I saw on some of your marketing about your about game theory. Like, what what's game theory, and how does it apply to repricing? Sure. Um, so, game theory is kind of where where the this cooperative approach of seller sap started. And so, when I mean right. the cooperative approach, because of when we're talking about the example I gave before, where we move up in price and our competitor moves with us, we're both winning. Right, we're both yeah. actually benefiting from seller staffing on that listing, and that was learned from game theory, a specific portion of game theory that's called um, the prisoner's dilemma, where um, there's two prisoners, and they're and each prisoner is told if you give up the other person, you'll get X sentence, um, yeah. but if neither of them give up each other, they both get out free. And so the yeah. idea is that if you work together, everybody wins, rather than working yeah. against each other and and everybody and everybody loses, right? And so that's the idea of coming from a cooperative approach. It's like, look, if we're just bringing up the price and we're working together, and we're um, our, you know, our customers are still buying that product at the higher price point, like, you know, there's so much market share in Amazon that, you know, we could both win, both make quality money, and and grow our businesses that way, rather than just fighting each other to the ground. That's super cool. And that's where it really benefits the other guy using your price for as well, I guess, because you're not going to commit, was it Sudoku? Where the Japanese guys like jump on their own swords. Yeah. You're not, you're not yeah. going to have one guy who's just set his price at the min. And then when you change up, it's not going to follow you. So everyone's yeah. got to reprice as you're around, which is awesome. Right. Well, th- th- there's always, you know, people on the market that that's their strategy. You know, they want to bully people yeah. off of listings by getting the best deal from their wholesaler. And, um, and doing it that way but again yeah. the majority of the people especially probably you know using our services or the earlier yeah. i should say where um you know you you're just trying to you're just trying to do your business make those purchases make those sales on on the marketplace and and move on to the next one yeah love it awesome so we are going to move on to the next part of the show you ready to play a game oh, i'm super excited love games me too. So we like to give back to our listeners and watchers. Um, if you're watching, you watch the wheel. If you're listening, um, yeah, sorry. You've got the sound effects, which we add post. So it's going to be a lot less cool when you're in here live. But actually post, we add sound effects. So um, what we do is every week we spin the wheel and we give the opportunity for listeners and watchers to win. So if you're watching this or listening, uh, click the link in the description and enter to win this and be entered for all competitions going forward. You have the chance to win this one if you're watching it if you're watching it soon after recording if not you'll be entered for all of the uh, draws going forward so very kindly ian has put forward one month of free repricing with uh seller snap uh, which will get added to our wheel which we have lots of amazing stuff we have consultations with don from accrue me uh we've got a consultation with brian from canopy management and online seller solutions we have many 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 exciting prizes on the wheel so you'd like to throw up the wheel there we go here's one we prepared earlier so you have control ian it's not actually real control but you have to actually just say spin that wheel and then the wheel will magically spin all right let's spin it and then what is it the suspense is killing me (laughs) imagine there's lots of cool cool sound effects so retail empire 20 minute free consultation 
um, with the Retail Empire guys. They're actually based in Tel Aviv as well. Do you know them, Ian? I you don't. Them? I don't. You'll, you'll have I to put a intro you. Yeah, I'll intro you. They're really cool. Um, all right. They removed from the wheel. Let's do one more spin. All right, let's do it. One more spin. Imagine amazing sound effects. <laughs> Ah, Armour Agency product idea violation. So if you are watching this and you are a reseller and you'd be looking for, to get into um, private label, then yeah, definitely and to take advantage of that. It will They will really help you validate some product ideas to figure out what you want to go into your first private label product. So I mean, that's a theme from a lot of the OA sellers that I've talked to is that they'd love to do both. You know, get into private label. Yeah, yeah. OA is great because the barrier to entry is is so much lower. And private label is great because you have a, a much more sellable asset at the end of it, usually. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, And it's good to diversify a little bit. You just yeah. never know, you know, when arbitrage deals run out, when wholesale deals run out, and having a little bit more control can can be really helpful. Uh, but also, on the on the flip side, the wholesale to arbitrage, you know that these are items that like, get sold anyways. So it's, uh, it's good to have a little bit of diversity in your portfolio. Yeah, totally agreed. And if you are looking to get into OA, um, Check out Seller Snap and also check out Chris Grant. He runs a thing called the OA Challenge. I think one's starting next week. And uh, yeah, he's helped so many people get into online arbitrage. And he's an amazing dude and a friend of the show. Nice. So we ask one, one, one question to every guest on this podcast. So Ian, what is one strategic element you think most people are missing when selling on Amazon? I think that one strategic element that people are missing when selling on Amazon, and this is not just selling on Amazon, all the biz and but like all businesses, um, I just got done rereading um, a book called Traction. If you haven't, for anyone that hasn't read it, it's a really, really great book um, that talks about, you know, working on the business and not in the business. And yeah. I think we often see because, you know, Amazon sellers are a lot of times like a one, a one man show or a one person show. And then they might bring on, um, especially in like the arbitrage space, you kind of bring on family members, you bring people out from your like your 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 immediate circle. Um, then you spend a lot of time really working in the business. Um, you know, packing boxes, making listings, adding um, adding them to seller central, repricing and everything. And when their objective is trying to scale, and in order to scale, you need to work on the business. You need to think about, you know, the strategy behind uh, behind growth and, and put, uh, put things in place in order to accomplish those objectives. So, um, so like the one thing that the one strategy piece that a lot of times the Amazon sellers are missing is that they're constantly working in the business rather than on the business. Yeah, that's super cool. Thank you for sharing. And, um, the attraction is an amazing book. Anyone that hasn't read it should, it's all about what the entrepreneurial operating system and the really cool thing about traction is it gives you the operating system. So it tells you how to set your vision, your values, your three-year plan, what your meetings should look like, how you can make decisions, how you should check in on people, you know, your quarterly rocks, olders. Like it's such a cool, such a cool thing. It's so cool. It's so complex. And, you know, even after going through it a couple of times, I still don't understand half of it. But it's it's one of those things that you can constantly, you know, pick up and and go back to and that can even use as a reference. It's a it's a fantastic, uh, a, fa a fantastic tool out there for anyone that has it. Has had a chance. Yeah, I sent it. I sent the physical copy to my COO a couple of weeks ago, um, and I was like, "Yeah, we should just, even if we can only take twenty percent of this in terms of some of our structures and some of the ways that we run things to make them even better, you know, we have a good operating system, but let's just make it even better." Twenty percent is high too. You know, like oftentimes you, you know, you go to, you read a book, you go to a conference, you listen to a podcast like this, and you're like, uh, everything that's said here is incredible." And then you go back and you sit at your desk and you're like, how do I implement these 10 things? But really at the end of the day, you need to be able to take, you know, one, maybe two things and implement those. And then once you've done that to completion, then you can turn around and, and implement the other things. Cause I, I, I figured the same way. I'm like, oh, let's get everything done. But it just, just doesn't work like that sometimes. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I'm a big Tony Robbins guy and I've been to a lot of their events and I'm actually a leader in the organization for during the team, the team part. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, at the end of every event after, you know, five days, 14 hours a day, they make you write down your three to five things 
that you want to implement and if you implement it change your life or change your business yeah. you know out of 60 hours of content yeah you have you have your no, your notebooks are this big and they're like boil it down to three and you're like how <laughs> yeah well if i did these three things it would change my life change my business and i love that so one final section ian is our rapid fire questions these are very complex life on the line questions no pressure just quick answers let's go uh okay Question number one, what is your favorite Amazon niche? My favorite Amazon niche? Arbitrage. I'm not sure what the question is. So if you could choose no pictures or no reviews, which would you pick? No reviews. Reviews, can't trust them half the time. <laughs> True. Uh, name a country that starts with the letter S. Switzerland. Which Amazon marketplace is the next big opportunity? Japan. Pineapple on pizza. Yes or no? Yes, I Absolutely. Think. No doubt. <laughs> a lot of uh, passion there. Uh, name something appealing about working from home. Doing laundry in between meetings. Uh, name something you'd hate to find swimming around in your bathtub. Your Jeff Bezos. <laughs> We've got a very big bathtub. <laughs> or uh, he's a very wide man. I don't know how tall he is, though. We got, um, Just a slight sidetrack. We got a life-size Jeff Bezos for our booth at Prosper Show this year. Because we thought it'd be a cool thing for people to come and take photos with it, but it was actually really good. Okay, but I don't know if it was life size or not, because it seemed like they made him the size big enough to fold into thirds inside the shipping package. They had a standard size shipping package, and he was only about five, like five ten. And when I when you see him, he looks he is rejacked, which means he might be quite small, but he kind of looks like a big guy, doesn't he? So it's really hard to. T yeah, but his personality is larger than life as well. Yeah, maybe he's like four eleven. He's just just super jacked i don't know it's the I'm vest it's, a, it's an extra small vest that he wears that black <laughs> one the life is a kid size um awesome so ian if you want to get in touch with you follow you follow you around the internet like what's the best thing to do um so if you on the internet you can um, you can you can find me on linkedin um you can always reach out to our website as well um at sellersap.io we do offer a free 15 day trial for anybody who wants to give seller staff a go, no credit card down, no commitment, just, um, just the commitment from us to provide, you know, quality onboarding, to give it a right. shot, to make sure, to try to, again, maximize profit, um, by avoiding price wars. And, uh, you can always reach out to, um, either myself or our wonderful support team, um, the customer success team to learn more. Love it. Thank you. So please do go check out seller snap. Um, I love seeing them at conferences. You guys have amazing booths. I remember going around seeing you guys last year. Um, so yeah, anyone who's watching, thank you for watching. And that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you so much, Ian, for, for being here, for sharing your time, for dialing in with you and your dog. And uh, if you enjoyed the show and you're watching, please do rate us on whatever platform you're watching, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and come back next week for another discussion. We are going to be launching season two in the coming two to three weeks which is going to be a different format so uh, very excited to launch that and tell you more about it so please do watch soon and thank you ian so much for being on the show thank you for having me 